Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Brain Food. I'm Greg Berry, Director in the Office of Alumni Affairs here at UAB. Since we're virtual, please excuse technical issues or glitches that we may experience. If you have issues with your video or audio, click the reconnect button at the top of your screen. This will get you back to the webinar quickly. Also, we are recording today's webinar and we'll upload it to our website today or tomorrow, depending on timing. This presentation is the final in a four-part series on nutrition, your diet, and you. Today, we're taking a look at foods that can help benefit our brain with Dr. Suzanne Judd. Dr. Judd is the director of the Lister Hill Center for Health Policy and a professor in the UAB School of Public Health. She joined the UAB family in 2008 as an associate professor after spending some time as an engineer at Kimberly Clark. She earned her Master of Public Health and PhD in Biological and Biomedical Sciences from Emory University. At this time, I would officially like to welcome Dr. Judd and send things over to you. Thanks again so much for joining us once again as a part of our webinar series. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. All right, well, thank you everybody for being here. Um, for those of you that saw me about a month ago now, I started with these few slides talking about diet to try to get you to think about where you're getting your, your last piece of nutrition advice. And I'm gonna use the first few slides again because I think it's important for those of you that didn't see it to take a minute and think about it. Who did give you your last piece of nutrition advice? Does it come from a doctor? Did it come from a friend? Did it come from a book? Likely the one place it did not come was a dietitian because very few people actually go to dietitians when they have questions about nutrition. Well, why is that? Well, here in the U.S., we have a history of um, the, this relationship with food, this desire for food to make us healthier, to find a solution either to lose weight or to optimize our health. And some of the originators of this food as medicine thought were the Kellogg brothers. Uh, Dr. Kellogg came up with this idea that uh, you could create perfect foods and those perfect foods could help with your, your lungs, your brain, your kidneys, everything to, to heal whatever ailed you as an individual. They founded the Battle Creek Sanitarium and people came from all over the world just to get extra um, nutritional supplements, um, what we would call it as a detox retreat today. Um, and you'll, you hear about those regularly. But this was a, a famous place in Battle Creek and really started with the Kellogg brothers. It's not just people wanting to lose weight that look for perfect food. Uh, Ansel Keys was a very famous physician during the uh, 50s and 60s focused on heart disease research. But before he was a famous cardiovascular researcher, he was a famous um, uh, nutrition researcher for the army. He was trying to develop a, a perfect food that soldiers could take on their back and be deployed into Europe and have at least two weeks of food on their back that was totally self-contained and they would be able to, um, to make it through to enemy lines on these two weeks worth of food. It was called the K ration. Um, he went through many different types of rations trying to figure out what that absolute optimal balance of food was to give the soldiers the energy, the, um, the protein, the uh, micronutrients they would need to make it through. Well, even in popular culture today, this is actually one of my favorite quotes from uh, The Simpsons where Homer, Homer says he only eats food in bar form. When you concentrate the food, you can unleash its awesome power, I'm told. And that's why he compressed five pounds of spaghetti into one mouth size bar. That's really the classic American way. That is, it really epitomizes a lot of what we try to do with society. We try to take things that might be in their natural form, like berries and nuts, and say, how do we just push it all together into something I can take on my back? You know, we're not fighting a war anymore, but we're going into work. We're taking our kids to school. And so we want that nutrition to just be on our backs and available to us really quickly and easily. So with all of these conflicting messages that people have, um, what do you eat for your brain? We're going to talk specifically about the brain today and what types of foods are, are really healthy for the brain. Michael Pollan actually had it right, even when it comes to brain health. Um, the reality is you just need to eat food, real food, not processed. The food is it came off a tree or came from animal. Um, in, in its most uh, natural form, uh, mostly plants, uh, not too much of those, and not too much food in general so that you don't gain weight. We also talked last time about the different types of nutrients, and it's important for us to, to talk about nutrients a little bit before we get started on the, the individual tips. 
So nutrients are substances found in food. And as a nutrition researcher, often I and my colleagues will break food down into their, their nutrient um, names. We'll talk about protein and carbohydrates and fat. We'll talk about micronutrients, which are your vitamins, your minerals. You'll hear about antioxidants. Those are all micronutrients because they don't have any calories associated with them. For the first tip, we're going to focus in this macronutrient category, thinking about energy and, and where we get our energy. And that first tip is to limit sugar. When you're thinking about your brain, it's really important that you don't give it too much sugar at one time. So what is sugar? Sugar is the same thing as glucose. In the, the nutritional science field, we refer to glucose because glucose is the fuel that, that your body uses. It's what your muscles use, your brain, your bones, they all use glucose. So we talk about it in terms of glucose, but it's basically sugar and it fuels the body. The problem is if you have too much sugar in your blood, it can actually cause problems. Um, it, in particularly for your brain, you might notice some brain fog, some, some exhaustion, some lack of clear thoughts. Uh, it can cause tiredness, even though that the glucose is what you use for energy. It can cause this feeling of lethargy. And in, in extreme cases, in people that have diabetes and they don't have the ability to pull glucose out of their blood rapidly, high glucose can actually lead to death. That's why it's really important to have your blood sugar in control if you are managing diabetes. In some people, when the body's exposed to too much sugar, it limits your body's ability to respond. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about type 2 diabetes, which type 2 diabetes we used to call adult onset. Um, and that's when your body can't clear the glucose out effectively because it, it becomes um, immune to the, the chemical insulin that is the one that would typically say, get the sugar out of the blood. Your, your muscles, your bone, they become immune to this um, circulating insulin. And so they don't pull glucose out of the, the blood as rapidly as, as it would in someone who doesn't have type two diabetes. Type one diabetes is a condition where your body does not make insulin at all. That typically happens during childhood. Um, when you see people that have type one diabetes, often they wear an insulin pump so that they can get insulin externally since their body doesn't make it internally. But again, it's that same challenge. Without insulin, you can't pull sugar out of your blood. You can't pull glucose out of your butt, blood. And so you wind up with really high circulating levels of sugar. I bring up the question, have you ever heard of type three diabetes? So in my field, probably five or six years ago, there started to be this, these whisperings of type three diabetes. And type three diabetes was really focused on sugar and the way sugar interacts in the brain. What happened, researchers started noticing that, that people who developed Alzheimer's, they were in, in studies and they would have their brains monitored. And they found out that people that went on to develop Alzheimer's about 10 to 20 years before they had Alzheimer's, they started, the researchers could actually see changes in the brain. They could see changes in the way that the body responded to sugar. And basically what we now know today is going on is that the, the brain, just like the muscles and the bones that I was talking about with type two diabetes, in, in the, the case of um, early onset Alzheimer's, the glucose doesn't metabolize the way that it should in the brain. It's not responding to, to the insulin and the signals that are out there. So there are several people in the, the, the nutrition world trying to figure out what does that mean? What, what does it mean that high insulin levels actually impact sugar metabolism in the brain and, and lead to dementia? But for you as an individual, what it means is be careful with sugar. Try not to eat too much sugar. Number one, it can lead to weight gain. And number two, it can cause some issues with just your overall functioning. That's why even probably when you were a kid, people would tell you, don't eat a high sugar lunch before you take a test. You know, the teachers will tell students that, uh, you, that, that extra sugar sometimes can lead to um, a little bit slower cognition. So how do you limit sugar? That's the, the hard part for most folks. The key is to avoid processed food. The, the food that's in the middle of the grocery store, everything that's not in the frozen section or the refrigerated produce section, everything down the middle, we call that the processed food. And it's because it can sit on the shelf for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time, which is great when you um, are in a, a time of food shortage. But when you're in your general uh, everyday healthy state, you don't need food that can sit on the shelf for long periods of time. 
You want to also avoid foods that are sweetened. So take a food like uh, like oatmeal or um, even coffee. You want to avoid sweetening those things. Try to eat them in their natural state. It might be a little bit difficult, um, so you might want to add something to make it a little better. But try doing that with with fruit or um, or something that's not quite as high in sugar. The the key, and that's why I put it in all caps, and it's the last one. Really avoid sweetened beverages. That's your soda, sweet tea, uh, things that have a lot of sugar, even lemonades and orange juices. If you buy them off the shelf and they don't come fresh squeezed, they can be really, really high in sugar. And the problem with liquid sugar is that your brain doesn't have a chance to respond. Your body doesn't have the chance to respond to know that it's got all that sugar flooding into the, the veins. So you really, if you can avoid those sweetened beverages, that's a, a huge tip for um for avoiding high sugar and then keeping your brain at optimal function. How do you know what's in food with sugar? We talked about nutrition labels last time, so I'm not gonna harp on it this time, but I do want you to take a look at a nutrition label because it's important for you to, to know where you can identify those sugars. Probably the most important thing that's come to a nutrition label in the last few years is this line item for added sugars. So if you direct your attention to the, the total carbohydrate line, you'll see it's got the grams of carbohydrate, but then it breaks it out by fiber, which is, that's a great carbohydrate. Get as much fiber as you can. And then sugars. So you can pick up that package in the middle of the grocery store and take a look and say, okay, how, how much added sugar is in this product? And 10 grams is a lot of added sugar. You can see that this, whatever this product is, would represent 20% of the total added sugars that it's recommended that a person have in a day. So this would probably be something you might want to avoid. Let's shift gears a little bit as we go into our next tips and talk about the Mediterranean diet. Our old friend Ansel Keys from before, I mentioned him. When he was in World War II, he actually worked as a combat medic. He noticed that the, the men specifically in the South Mediterranean lived much, much longer than the American businessmen he was familiar with from Minnesota. He was at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And he was interested, why do these men have such so much longer longevity than, than what American men do? And why aren't they dying of heart disease? So he looked at their diet. He was interested in diet. He'd been creating the K rations for the soldiers previously, and he became very focused on what they eat in the Mediterranean that was very different than what he saw in the United States. The things he noticed that were quite different were the amount of legumes, fish, fruits, vegetables, olive oil, and how very little dairy they ate. And he described this in his, his initial papers when he came back. It took many, many years, obviously 40 or 50 years for scientists to pick up this concept as well. And we picked that up with what we call the Mediterranean diet today. Um, the, this team from Harvard uh, took a look at, at population-based studies and tried to come up with a score so people could see how well they were adhering to a Mediterranean-based diet. That was with us for about 20 years. And then another group came along and developed the MIND diet. And the MIND diet is very similar to the Mediterranean diet. It's actually a, a hybrid diet between uh, the Mediterranean diet and a clinical trial diet called the DASH diet. The DASH diet was designed around lowering blood pressure, and the brain is very sensitive to high blood pressure levels. So taking the, the best of the DASH diet and combining it with the best of the Mediterranean diet, these researchers at Rush, at, uh, Rush developed a diet that they thought that if they could put people on would actually benefit brain health. They came up with 10 pro-brain food groups, and those are the ones we're going to talk about in depth. I'm not going to specifically talk about the, the food groups that are less beneficial, but just know that it's important that for the, the foods that are in the less beneficial group, swap those out for the ones in the beneficial group, because the, these are the foods that are, don't have as much benefit for your brain. And this is actually a book that you can find. You can look on the internet and look up the MIND diet. Um, this has become more and more popular. We're all still eagerly awaiting the final clinical res uh, trial results from the MIND diet. The trial's been going on now about eight years. Early findings are very positive that they can slow the, the um, development of dementia by putting people on this diet, but we're still waiting for the absolute final clinical trial results before we, um, we know how well it worked. These things take time. Uh, you can imagine someone has to change their diet and then they have to be followed for 10 to 15 years to see uh, how the changes in the brain actually happen. 
So let's break apart each one of these individual components and see how they might benefit the brain and how you might incorporate it into your daily life. Green leafy vegetables. On anything that you see, you're going to see green leafy vegetables broken out, whether it's beneficial for heart disease, reducing liver cancer, improving brain health, you name it. Green leafy vegetables are always going to make the top of the list. This is kale, collards, broccoli, uh, Swiss chard, romaine lettuce, so many different vegetables in this, this category that you can eat. The key when you prepare them is try to prepare them as minimally as possible because remember, we're trying to avoid some of these things like butter and cheese um, when we're mixing them together. So you're trying to get more like the olive oil, just a teeny tiny bit of salt um, or, or some type of non-salt seasoning onto the vegetables or even steam them. In a, a study from Rush, this is the same group that came up with the MIND diet. This was really one of the reasons they included it in the MIND diet. They found that people who ate basically daily um, some type of green vegetable had a much, much slower rate of cognitive decline. So compared with people who ate barely any green vegetables per day, those who ate one serving a day, it was associated with, with maintaining brain health uh, and being 11 years cognitively younger than those that didn't eat the green vegetables. So that, that means aging really well. That means maintaining your brain function. Um, and, and being 11 years younger in the brain than, than other folks. What about other vegetables? So everybody always says to me, well, why, does, why don't the other vegetables matter? Well, they do. The, the other vegetables do matter, especially the brighter the color. You know, those bright red vegetables, the bright yellow, bright orange, they all bring additional micronutrients that are helpful for you. Each one is different in what it has, um, but know that if you just eat a rainbow of vegetables, you'll be getting a lot of, of great micronutrients that are beneficial for the brain. The other thing that vegetables have is fiber. They have fiber that can help to slow the release of that sugar that we talked about in tip number one. So you can actually um, eat the vegetables and help, help to keep your blood sugar a little more stable over time. Berries, and when we talk about fruit, we're finding more and more that berries are the, the go-to brain food, food for fruit, which doesn't mean you shouldn't eat apples. I had an apple this morning or bananas, though they're also good. But berries, if you can work those into your diet and try to get them in at least two or three times a week, you get a benefit from some specific flavonoids, which are micronutrients found in berries. Um, and, and again, the researchers have found that these specific flavonoids help to delay, delay cognitive decline. There are also studies in children where uh, berry smoothie was more effective than other fruit smoothie in terms of academic performance that day at school. So the, the berries just seem to have some extra benefits that some of the other fruits don't have. That doesn't mean if you hate berries and you just say, okay, well, fine, if I can't eat berries, I'm not eating anything, don't take it that way at all. If you can only eat apples and oranges, only eat apples and oranges. But if you're willing to make some modifications to your fruit, berries are a really good choice for your brain health. Beans. This came back again from um, Ansel Keys. Remember he saw legumes, that there were a lot of legumes consumed in um, Mediterranean diets. And again, when researchers looked at it at Rush, they found that beans were a wonderful source of protein and a good source of fiber. They also, you can see, are multicolored, so they bring in some of those antioxidants that are really good for your brain as well. The antioxidants kind of go around your blood and in different parts of your body and eat up any free radicals, any oxidative damage that's happening. They go in and they eat that inflammation up and try to, to lower and tamper down the inflammation in your body. So beans here become a source of protein also fiber and with their bright colors, some antioxidants that can benefit your brain. So beans are another good thing to work into your diet each week. What about nuts? Well, you'll, you notice that in the Mediterranean diet and then also the mind diet, nuts are something that people regularly recommend. Why do they do that? Well, nuts are full of fat, uh, which normally people try to avoid fat, but the fat in nuts is a really good choice. Some nuts, like walnuts, actually contain omega-3 fatty acids. Those omega-3 fatty acids are specifically good for brain health. Um, they're the same types of fatty acids you might find in fish. So consuming uh, macadamia nuts, walnuts, that can really help to, to be a powerful brain food and, and keep your brain functioning. 
The other thing nuts have, just like the, the beans that we talked about before, is fiber. And we keep talking about fiber over and over again. And when we get to the end of the talk, you'll hear a little bit why, about why fiber is so needed for the gut. But know that, again, the nuts have that great source of, of fat and a good source of fiber, um, two things that are beneficial for your brain. What about whole grains? You saw that in the MIND diet as well. Why, why are whole grains recommended? Well, if you're eating a lot of fruit and a lot of vegetables and beans, you might be struggling with feeling full. Um, a lot of people need some type of, of heavier carbohydrate like pasta or bread to feel full. Well, I would recommend maybe consider switching to something uh, like a whole grain, a whole grain pasta, a brown rice, a whole grain bread. The whole grains have fiber and that fiber really helps with the feeling of fullness. It's beneficial for the bacteria that live in your colon or your large intestine or your gut, whatever you wanna call it. Um, the, the fiber is really good for those gut bacteria. When the fiber makes it down into the gut and the bacteria are able to digest it, they actually um, produce these small chain fatty acids, these butyric acid, uh, capric acid, winds up in your blood and your brain really likes those types of fats. The only place you get those in your diet is from the bacteria that are consuming the, the fibers that make it down into the gut. So it's really important to have good bacteria and to have fiber to feed that bacteria. Poultry. We haven't talked much about protein other than legumes, but you want to have a good source of protein in your diet as well. Protein uh, helps to offset any kind of uh, sugar surges it leads to a feeling of fullness. Uh, protein typically makes you feel more full than other macronutrients that you eat. So it's, it's good to mix in some protein with every meal to make sure that you are keeping that sugar intake down. It also helps maintain your lean muscle mass. And the more lean muscle mass you have, um, hopefully you do some strength training on the side too, some cardiovascular activity, that muscle mass actually acts as a sink so that when you do eat sugar, your muscles can take up the, the sugar and, um, and not have them get, get stuck in the blood and, and cause the issues they can cause with diabetes. Fish. Fish is another great source of protein in the protein category, but it also has those omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, you're starting to see more and more fish oil supplements out there. It's, um, it, it's something you can buy, even if you can't eat fish, you can take a fish oil supplement so that you can get those omega-3 fatty acids. But most people forget that fish is not just a source of fatty acids, it's actually a really good source of protein. And just like the poultry that we mentioned over here, fish tends to be a good source of protein without the saturated fats. And in, in that avoid category from the MIND diet, saturated fats are something you want to avoid. They can lead to increased inflammation um, and that increased brain aging that we're trying to avoid with some of these other pieces of our diet. The next fat we're gonna talk about is olive oil. And over and over again, we hear about olive oil. It really started with the Mediterranean diet, as we mentioned before, where um, Ansel Keys noticed that people in the, the Mediterranean consumed tons and tons of olive oil. So they, they really were, um, he, he thought that was a key component of, of their dietary health. As it came to the US, there really, we don't do a ton of olive oil production here, at least we didn't in the 40s and 50s. So it was hard for Americans to get access to olive oil. On the other hand, we have tons of canola oil because of the vegetables that we grow here. So canola oil tended to be our primary oil. Now it's pretty easy to find olive oil. Um, so it's, it's something that you can get and incorporate into your diet. Olive oil in uh, France, in the United States, in the UK, uh, in the Netherlands, in all of those countries has been shown to reduce the, the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's in long-term clinical studies. So when people make that swap and put olive oil in their diet instead of other oils, you see a better, um, better cognitive function and lower risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. So olive oil is another one of those that's really important to work into your diet. Olive oil is not just the fat, that, that, um, that monounsaturated fat. It actually has antioxidant benefits as well. The olives themselves, when they're extracted, are quite brightly colored, and, and those antioxidants that are in the olives get pressed into the oil, and that, again, leads to decreased inflammation um, and antioxidant benefits. Turmeric, we're jumping away from these big foods, and this is not specifically included in the MIND diet. 
but there are many clinical trials right now looking at turmeric. Turmeric uh, reduces oxidative stress, and there's this new concept called inflammaging that you're hearing in, in some of the scientific press. Inflammaging is that, that process of inflammation leading to more aggressive aging. So, you know, you get to be 60, but your, your mind is really more like a 75-year-old. So you want to have things that keep your, your mind at, a, um, at the age that your, your physical body is. And things like turmeric may help with that. Uh, there's still ongoing clinical trials. I would say the evidence is pretty mixed. In small-scale trials, it does appear to be beneficial. Some of the larger trials, it hasn't played out quite as much. But supplements don't tend to get great clinical trials. Um, you know, pharmaceutical companies can't really sell turmeric. So there's not a lot of money behind the clinical trials to, to be able to test it. But in the small scale lab studies, turmeric has definitely been associated with um, lower risk of inflammation and, and, and decreased inflammation in the body. So where do you get turmeric? Uh, turmeric is available in the powder form. You've probably seen that in the, the grocery store in the, um, the spice area. You can also get it in its raw root form. It looks like ginger, but it's except it's a little bit smaller and it's very yellow in the middle. One of the ways that you know that turmeric really has those colorful antioxidant benefits, if you've worked with it, it can really stain your counter. It can stain your dishes and your counter and your clothes. So you have to be careful with turmeric. It's this bright, bright yellowish orange color, and it's, um, it can lead to some staining. One thing we know about it is that you may need to combine it with black pepper, that, that um, having the turmeric with the black pepper, the two together, seems to be more powerful for reducing inflammation than the turmeric by itself. So think about that. When you're cooking, you just add a little bit of black pepper. If you're going to take a supplement, make sure the supplement you have um, also contains the black pepper and the turmeric. The supplement may say curcumin. Uh, curcumin is the actual compound within turmeric. So you can look for turmeric or curcumin. Let's talk a little bit about gut health. You heard me mention it before on the fruits and vegetables and the fiber, 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 whole grains. You probably are sick of me hearing about fiber and why you need it for your gut. But we are learning so much about how the bacteria that naturally live in our large intestine are beneficial players in our brain health and our, our overall health. Uh, things like probiotics, you probably heard about probiotic supplements um, from the news. But there are other ways to have probiotic or to, to maintain good, good health. The first is just eating fermented products. You can buy sauerkraut. You can buy kombucha. There are many different fermented products on the, the market that you can consume. You can even ferment your own vegetables um, so that you get some of these beneficial bacteria. Yogurt is full of good bacteria. And there are even yogurts out there that specifically market for having um, higher concentrations of various bacteria. So that's another good source of good gut uh, bacteria. We talked about fiber before, but I'm gonna bring it up again, fiber, fiber, fiber. The fiber feeds those bacteria. It makes it down into your gut and it helps your gut to, to um, have lots of food so that it can, your gut, your, the, the bacteria in your gut, so that it can feed those bacteria and spill over beneficial fatty acids into your blood. So that fiber is so important for feeling full and, fe and for feeding those bacteria. Again, you can also get your probiotics from supplements. So there are lots of different places to get those probiotics um, when you're, you're looking to maintain your gut health. I want to take it back here um, for the question and answer session because I want to have this slide pulled up specifically. Let's see here. Because this is where you can find out more information. We broke down specifically here uh, all of the various uh, vegetables, uh, legumes, whole grains. We didn't talk about alcohol, uh, but it, it wine, red wine has been shown to be associated with a decreased risk of dementia. But I'll say it's pretty hard to study alcohol and clinical trials. We can't force people to drink. So the evidence for that is um, mostly uh, longitudinal cohort studies. So I wouldn't say go ahead and start drinking if you're not currently drinking. That's why I didn't consume that one in the conversation today. But if you have questions about alcohol, feel free to, to toss them in the chat. 
And with that, I'd love to have some questions from the chat. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been great, great information. And all, as always, we've got a whole flow of questions coming in. So I'll start with this one. Are you avoiding sugar if your drink uses stevia as a sugar substitute? You are technically. So stevia does not have glucose in it. So you're at, you're sweetening your food um, without getting the, the glucose that's going to cause the problems. The only issue with sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, there has been evidence that putting sweeteners in food uh, makes people eat more. So you just kind of have to watch that. If you notice that when you put stevia in your lemonade or in your oatmeal, now you eat twice as much as you would if it weren't in there, you may want to cut back a little. And I'm assuming this next question refers to fresh versus frozen. Are frozen berries just as good? They are. Absolutely. Frozen berries are just as good and, and they sometimes taste even better when berries are not in season. So feel free to go to the frozen section and grab those berries. Are there any foods you can eat with the beans to counteract the gassiness they cause? Oh, that's, that is one of the challenges with beans. So um, with beans, there are a couple of things that you can do. Oil, any oils can help to, to decrease some of that. You can also make sure you're taking that probiotic supplement so that you have enough of those good bacteria in your gut to, um, to digest it without producing a lot of, of gas. What about chickpea pasta? Yeah, it's one of my new favorites. <laughs> I think it tastes great. If you look at the nutrition label, it's got tons of fiber. You've got those actual chickpeas in there, high source of protein. Um, that, that's a really great way to go if it's something that, that's affordable in your budget. Are flax seeds good for you? And if so, how? Absolutely. So flax seeds are going to fall into that, um, that nuts. Really, the nuts category is a nut slash seed. And the flax seeds uh, would go in there. You want to make sure they're ground or um, strained into an oil. Whole flax seeds can be very difficult to digest and, and don't provide as much nutritional benefit. But ground flax seeds, you can actually get the fiber out of those. You can get the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, or like I said, you can pick up a flax oil, uh, actual um, bottle of flax oil. So definitely would be one of the things in the beneficial category. You talked a little bit about fresh fruit, berries, talked a little bit about frozen. How about dried? Dried is good too. Uh, the only downside of dried is it tends to be a little bit sweeter. And so people might over consume it because it tastes really good. It's the difference between like a grape and a raisin. You notice that that raisin is really sweet. Um, so sometimes people overeat dried fruit, but it's a, another great source. What are good olive oil brands? This person hears so much about fake olive oil on the shelves. Yeah, that's that, that's definitely something that worries people. I think um, that Spectrum is a good brand on the market that has a, a lot of, um, they, they post a lot of their manufacturing processes. They tell you where they source it. Any olive oil that actually tells you where it's sourced so you know where the farm was and where it was produced is going to be a decent source of olive oil. Organic's going to tend to be a little bit better because they have stricter manufacturing processes. I don't think it matters. You'll, if you read some people's books, you'll read that Greek olive oil matters more than Italian or Spanish or Californian. I don't think that's true. Any olive oil is good. Whatever you can find and afford, um, make sure you look at it to, to look at the processing to see that in the ingredient list, it is actually olive oil. But other than that, it should be fine. Any truth to the uh, rumor that if you cook the olive oil, it loses its good properties? It does, actually. The olive oil, um, the best way you could get it is to toss it on a salad. That's where you really get it. The antioxidants are in it as well. So if you can do it without cooking with it and use it instead in a salad and then use um, a different oil for your high temperature cooking, like a coconut oil or hemp or avocado, um, those tend to do better on high temperatures than olive oil does but you're not gonna hurt yourself by cooking with olive oil. If you just want one oil in your house and make life simple, that, that's perfectly fine. It, it's just gonna smoke a little bit easier than some of the other olive or the other oils. And you will, when you cook with it, lose some of its nutritional benefit. This person's been told to limit high oxalate foods such as spinach, nuts, potatoes, carrots, blueberries, and especially bran and high fiber cereals and the whole wheat bread. They now have a difficult time finding a good fiber source. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, that's tough. Um, it, it, when you have to reduce oxalate, that there, it's in so many different things. 
Um, you can take a look at some of the nuts and the seeds and see specifically if some of those might be a benefit because there's great fiber in, in nuts and seeds. Um, vegetables are another great source of fiber, but you have to eat a lot of it. So it, it, it can be tough when you're, when you're limiting the grains and the, the beans. What do you think about veganism and brain health? You know, it's it depends. There's two different types of veganisms. There's healthy veganism and there's um, less healthy veganism. You know, for example, Twizzlers are a vegan item. <laughs> I don't know that I would recommend a Twizzler diet. So as long as it's a vegan diet that it has a the same type of variety we're talking about here, lots of different vegetables, lots of different fruits, grains, um, nuts, then it, that's a great diet. You can even get the omega-3 fatty acids from like algae sources. So you don't even need to use a fish oil for your, your omega-3 fatty acid. It certainly can be healthy. Just you have to be careful that it's not one of those unhealthy vegan diets. Is there a good yogurt? You know, any yogurt is pretty good. Any yogurt is going to have good bacteria. Some have more. Um, so some like actually fortify their yogurt with even higher dose. And you can read the, the number of bacteria in each, each yogurt. Uh, the Greek yogurt are less sweet. So same with French. French and Greek yogurts tend to be a little less sweet. So you're going to minimize your sugar. Um, but no, any yogurt is good. Is apple cider vinegar a good source for gut health? It is. It, it's also fermented. So you can get lots of good bacteria from apple cider vinegar if you can, if you can tolerate it. You know, as my grandpa aged, I used to watch him take a shot of apple cider vinegar. I don't know how he did it. But um, he always took it. He said it helped with his arthritis, but I'm not sure about that. We've talked about beans. What are some of the good beans? Lots of different good beans. You've got lentils that are really high in protein and easy to cook. It's the problem with beans, you either get them canned and then you might have a lot of sodium or you have to cook them and they can be challenging to cook. But lentils take that, that problem away. They're super easy to cook. They cook up really quickly, um, easy to eat. Um, other garbanzos, we, we mentioned those in pasta. That's another really good one to consider. But then any bean that you like, black beans, navy beans, they're all very healthy and beneficial in terms of protein and fiber. How about agave syrup for sweetening? Agave would be in the same category as, say, honey, where it's a sweetener that um, doesn't act rapidly on the blood, but it's still a sweetener. It still is eventually going to produce glucose, and um, so you want to limit it. it. It's perfectly fine in small quantities, but again, you don't want to be dumping it on there. Uh, maple syrup would be in that same category. All three of those are kind of liquid sweeteners that are maybe a little bit better than table sugar, but still just take it easy. If you're allergic to fish oil, what are the best ways to get omega-3, 6, and 9s? So it depends on what part of the fish oil you're allergic to. Um, I, I have not heard of a, a omega-3 fatty acid allergy, so hopefully that's not what it is. Um, but then you're, you're looking at walnuts would be a really good source of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, you also could take a look at some of the algae-based supplements that are, are non-fish related. But again, it depends on what the allergy itself is. So you'll have to make sure that the supplement, even if it's fish-free, that it, it doesn't have whatever you're allergic to in there. Do the beans need to be sprouted? They don't, but interestingly, you get some additional nutritional benefits when they are sprouted. So the, there's some, um, the, some benefits in terms of the micronutrient composition. It also helps to break down that, um, that fibrous wall that beans have. Some people find that sprouting the beans eliminates the gas. So that, that's another reason why people sometimes sprout their beans. Are the other forms of artificial sweeteners okay to use for daily use in coffee or tea? Yeah, yeah, they're okay. Like I mentioned before, it just watch it to make sure that it doesn't lead to, to overconsumption. If you put sweetener in your tea and that helps you drink 10 cups of it, that, that might be a little bit too much. But, um, but generally, small consumption is perfectly fine daily. Any foods best when being treated for cancer? Antioxidants. Those, those antioxidants, that's the brightest colored food that you can find. You know, your sweet potatoes, your green vegetables, if you can tolerate it, that the challenge is chemotherapy. So you also, you're trying to balance um, the nutrients with what your stomach will allow to be in, to enter in the stomach. So you wanna kind of look through and see, you know, what, what can you eat, what makes you feel good, um, what doesn't cause nausea, and, and try to stick in those fruits and vegetable categories. Um, you may find beans are way too tough to digest, but if, if you can digest them, they're another good source. Um, nuts and nut oils it can also help. Sometimes you just need to get extra calories in. 
So you can use a good oil like an olive oil or a walnut oil and put it on top of, of the uh, maybe some pasta or something else you are able to eat. And that helps to get those calories up as well. How do you assess the quality of supplements, like including the quality of the soil, for example, where ingredients are sourced? Oh, yeah. Um, that's definitely a part of it. That's going to affect how much um, supplement is in there. But for me personally, the way I um, evaluate supplements is I look for something called the good manufacturing practices label or the GMP label. That means that the factory that they're made in is um, compliant with FDA best practices for making a quality controlled product. That means they test it regularly. So they pull it off the line, they put it into an analyzer and they verify that if it says 10 milligrams of selenium, there are 10 milligrams of selenium in there. So look for that, that FDA, that GMP compliant label. That'll tell you that the supplement is, is made and in, um, in tightly regulated. You just can't know when it comes to soil quality. That's our soil has have been so stripped from nutrients. It's really tough um, to to actually know exactly what's what's in certain, um, particularly uh, greens, beans, things that are grown in the soil. So if you're going with a supplement, look for that GMP label, and you should be pretty comfortable that that you're getting what it says. Is there anything special about oat fiber? Oat fiber provides. Um, more of the, the fiber that your gut likes, the gut bacteria. So oat fiber actually specifically does help with heart disease and brain health. Um, but it's, it's only if you have enough of those good bacteria in your colon. So you have to make sure that's well balanced as well. And, and you've got a good source of, you know, either fermented foods or a probiotic. You want those, those good gut uh, bacteria in there and it'll make you feel full. Um, it's not different than any other fiber. The oat fiber isn't, but, um, all fibers make you feel full, but it does uh, differentially feed those bacteria. Is avocado oil as good and healthy as olive oil, especially for cooking? It looks like it is. Um, we don't have as much uh, history with avocado oil on the market, so we don't have the long-term studies we have with the olive oil, but it certainly has a lot of the same benefits that, that olive oil has. I actually cook with avocado oil now because it doesn't smoke. It makes it a lot easier when you're sauteing something. Um, if you're like me and you get distracted easily and the phone rings and all of a sudden you've walked off on it, it's, it's a little safer in my kitchen to use avocado oil. <laughs> is the cold extracted olive oil better? It is. The cold pressed allows for um, basically the processing allows the antioxidants to retain their their concentration so they don't get burned up in the manufacturing process. You'll get more of those good antioxidants in a cold pressed olive oil. If purchasing a probiotic or a prebiotic pill, is there a recommended brand and or amount to take? It's really individual specific, depending on how your gut's doing. Um, I change my brand up all the time. I look at the store, see what's on sale. A lot of these things that we've talked about are not cheap. So you have to really balance it with what your pocketbook can afford. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I really, I look at what's on sale. <laughs> if it's on sale, that's the one I go with. I try to get, you know, as many microorganisms, as many million or billion cultures as I can. Um, but I'm not going to spend $130 on a monthly supplement. So it, it really is, a, it's that balancing of the pocketbook and the, the bacteria. What type of non-dairy milk is best? Mm, that's really up to you and your favorite, because um, there are different kinds of best. Some people would say almond oil is the best because it's the lowest in calories. Other people would say almond oil is terrible because it's not sustainable. Some people would say oat milk is the best because it's very sustainable. Other people would say, yeah, but it's really high in calories. So you're, this debate will rage for years and years to come. Um, soy milk, the one, the thing people don't like about soy is that it has those phytoestrogens in it that can mimic estrogen in the blood. Some people say that's good. Some people say avoid it. Um, then some of the newer ones, macadamia nut, um, rice milk, there are lots of different ones, hemp milk, so many different ones on the market. Um, is there a best one? Again, it really de depends on what you're trying to optimize. If it's the planet, if it's your own personal body, uh, is it calories? It really just depends what you're trying to optimize. In general, they're all good as long as you don't have an allergy to one of the, those nuts or seeds. This person heard about American olive oil not being real. Have you heard about that? Has it been studied? Uh, <laughs> yeah, by the European olive oil producers. Um, <laughs> the, 
it is definitely real. Um, it's real olive oil. It has the real nutrients in it. There are people that argue that the stuff in the south of the Mediterranean is, is superior. Superior on, on what grounds? You know, you might say slightly higher antioxidant concentrations, but um, as long as it's it's made in a way where the um, under good manufacturing practices, where it's, it's cold pressed, it really doesn't matter if it's Californian or, or Greek. This person likes to bake sourdough bread. What is a good oil for that besides canola oil? And what are your thoughts overall on sourdough breads? Yeah, canola does work the best with sourdough breads, um, but you can try olive. It won't be quite as, um, it won't work quite as well as canola does. And sourdough is a great, great bread source. It's fairly low in sugar relative to other breads because that you know, the, the sourdough culture itself eats up the sugars. And so it's, it's a great source of, um, uh, of bread. Thoughts on using Benefiber as a supplement? Absolutely. If you don't like nuts and beans and um, vegetables, Benefiber is a great way to get your supplemental fiber. Metamucil, you know, any of those um, fiber containing psyllium, you can get psyllium by itself. It gets you the fiber you need. And, and some people just don't like to eat high uh, quantities of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So if that's the case, getting your fiber from a supplement is a great way to go. The dairy challenged people want to know, is coconut yogurt also good for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Coconut yogurt, they make almond milk yogurt. Um, you, I've seen hemp, oat milk yogurt. Any of those have the same cultures in it. And it, it's also good for you. What are some foods associated with short, short chain fatty acids? So short chain fatty acids, coconut oil is a good source of short chain fatty acids. And then anything that is um, the, the insoluble fibers, they make it to your gut and those gut bacteria, they turn into short chain fatty acids. So the, the high fiber foods and then uh, coconut oil would be great sources. This person doesn't use oil or butter in their cooking and usually steam or microwave foods. Uh, they do eat an ounce of guacamole daily. Is oh, there wow. any, yeah. Is there any advantage to adding a teaspoon of olive oil to their healthy eating? I would. Yeah. That's try to mix it up a little. You get a few things from olive oil that you don't get from avocados. And so adding just a little bit of, of olive oil, you could do it three times a week. If you didn't want to do it every day, it'll just give you that extra variety that the, the most important thing with diet is variety. So just using avocado for your source of fat, you're not getting quite the variety you would if you added in a little bit of, of olive, a little bit of coconut, just mix it up every now and then. What's the real benefit of drinking lemon water? And is it true that lemon helps us absorb iron from foods? Scientifically, no. There is really no um, evidence that lemon water is beneficial. I should backstep. Um, vitamin C specifically, which is found in lemons, does help you absorb iron. So let's break the questions into two and know that it's important when you have iron to have vitamin C, which lemons, oranges, they do have high quantity of vitamin C. Lemon water itself, there are a couple of things that lemon does um, in terms of nutrition. It may help you drink more water. Some people hate the taste of water and they find that if they add a lemon, they can drink more water and stay hydrated. Lemons do have vitamin C and um, citric acid, some antioxidants. So you get some benefits in that way too. Is it the, you know, Homer Simpson's perfect food? No. Do I drink lemon water every morning when I wake up? Yes. You know, it's, it's one of those things that um, if you like it and it, it helps you to drink more water, definitely go for it, but don't beat yourself up if you hate it. Do oils like walnut oil contain omega-3 similar to the nuts? They do. Yep. The, the pressed oil will also have those good omega-3s in it. So walnut oil is another uh, great oil that you can throw in there. Just again, it's one of those things that it gets expensive. So you didn't mention eggs as a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. Is there a reason why eggs are not included as brain food? Eggs can definitely be brain food. The, the jury um, is out. There are some studies that show that uh, some of the compounds in eggs are not beneficial, particularly the saturated fats that are found in the egg yolk. So there, it kind of goes back and forth, which is why I didn't include the eggs. But certainly if you're going to eat eggs, making sure that they're, they're free range, uh, organic and high in omega-3 fatty acids, that's another good dietary protein source. And I think you might've hit on this, but thoughts on honey? Honey, it would be in the category with agave and maple syrup. It's a sweetener. Um, use it sparingly, especially if you're trying to maintain your weight, but it'd it be better than table sugar. 
And we'll take about four more minutes to go through questions. Um, and we have many, many coming in. So is there any of these good foods that they should avoid if they're pre-diabetic? Of the healthy foods, fruits are going to be the ones that are the most um, challenging for you if you're pre-diabetic because they're the highest in sugar. So you may want to be careful with some of the fruits, um, especially the ones that are, are really sweet. Uh, but it doesn't mean don't eat fruit. It means just limit so that you're not eating five or six servings of fruit at one time. Otherwise, vegetables, nuts, whole grains, those are all pretty good for, for pre-diabetes. This person says triamine is one of... Uh the migraine triggers that they have, and so many foods have high triamine, is there a low triamine diet that you could recommend? That I haven't seen a low triamine diet. Um, that would be one that you'll have to probably very specifically contact a nutritionist to put up a, a nutrition plan for you. Um, and, and that, if you know that that's one of your triggers, you should be able to get into a nutritionist with the help of your doctor. Does oatmeal have to be steel cut? It doesn't have to be. I think that's a preference thing, whether you like it rolled or steel cut. How about homemade kombucha? If you know how to do it, go for it. <laughs> I've tried before. It tastes terrible when I make it. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. But um, but yeah, absolutely. Homemade kombucha is just as good as the store-bought, and it's like one-tenth of the cost. So it's a great source of, of um, beneficial bacteria. Any contradictions to this person drinking several cups of non-fat milk each day as a source of protein in addition to non-fat Greek yogurt and chicken? No, milk is definitely a source, especially if you're trying to put on muscle mass, if you're trying to gain weight, um, milk is a, a great source of, of protein. It also has quite a bit of sugar in it. So just, you'll have to watch the sugar, but as long as, like I said, you're not trying to lose weight, it's probably perfectly fine. Any reason to not use hummus, black bean, or chickpea as a source of beans? Nope, that's a great source of beans. Hummus is, is wonderful and you can get all different types of hummus. It doesn't have to be chickpea. So that's a, a great one. You can even dip your vegetables in it. How about truffle oil? I mean, it's delicious, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> Nutritional benefit, eh, it's okay. Um, it, it, I would go for olive oil over truffle oil, uh, but it does taste good. <laughs> what about acid, alkaline food and drink? Yeah, that's become a really popular comment um, topic lately, lo looking at alkaline diets and, and the benefit. Really, if you study an alkaline diet, though, it's just a high, um, high, fiber, um, lots of fats. It, it's, it's a little bit, it's a lot like what we've talked about with the mind diet. I don't think you have to specifically adhere to many of the tenets of it, but if it helps you to eat more fruits and vegetables and um, get the healthy fats in there, then it's, it's perfectly fine. And the last question that we'll do before we, we let you go, what about hot tea? We drink tea frequently. What are good tea brands and what about coffee? Yeah, I didn't cover tea or coffee, but you're absolutely right. In fact, in the American diet, the number one source of antioxidants is tea. So tea is another something that you can consume that helps um, to, to get compounds into your blood that reduce inflammation, that reduce oxidation, which, which makes it healthy for your brain. Both coffee and tea have antioxidants, but also have caffeine. Caffeine can go both ways for your brain for about 85% of the population, caffeine is going to give you a, a brief stimulus so that you're going to feel a little more engaged. Cognitively, you'll perform better. Physically, you can perform better. But about 15% of you out there, caffeine may make you jittery. If it makes you jittery, avoid it. You can get great decaf coffees and, and teas and get the antioxidant benefits without the caffeine. Fantastic questions for from today's audience and fantastic answers from you. Thank you so much, Dr. Judd, again, for being with us and sharing your expertise on brains and, and diets. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for all the great questions. You're so welcome. And just a reminder to our audience, today's webinar has been recorded. It'll be made available on our website. So watch out for that. Meanwhile, I would love to have you join us for the 2022 Alumni Awards Dinner and Annual Meeting. Join us Friday, September 23rd, as we honor this year's Alumni Award recipients and rising star winners during a seated dinner at the Alumni House. We'll also be honoring Dr. Judd. Tickets for this event uh, is, are only 25 bucks, and you can register at alumni.uab.edu slash awards night. Also, mark your calendar and get your tickets for the first ever Blazer Bingo on Thursday, October 6th, part of Homecoming Week. For only $25, you'll be able to play 10 games with six boards at a time. Enjoy food, compete for prizes, enjoy the company of fellow Blazers while raising money for scholarships. And we'll also have a cash bar available. You can register at alumni.uab.edu slash 
Bingo. And don't miss out on upcoming webinars. Join us next Thursday, September 21st for Blockchain and Web 3.0, A Decentralized World. Join Dr. Christopher Edmonds and his brother, Dr. Mark Edmonds, as we get an insight into virtual currency. Then be a part of a special Halloween webinar when we host witches, representations, and retellings on Thursday, October 26th, or 7th, rather. Discover the historical context of witches and witch narratives. And on Tuesday, November 8th, be part of what pet parents should know about obesity and diabetes as we look at how the extra weight your dog or cat is carrying is increasing their risk in developing preventable diseases. Finally, let us know how we're doing. We'd love to know. The QR code on your screen will take you to a short survey. Give us your feedback about what you liked and what you'd, what you'd like to see. So once again, thank you so much for joining us to, for today's webinar. And as always, go Blazers.